Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode three of the podcast. This episode is on helping people with dyslexia. As a follow on from uh, last week's episode, me and Richard talked about the book, The Gift of Dyslexia and the Dyslexia Correction Program. We have Rebecca on today's program. She, as part of that course, got trained up to help me facilitate achieving the course goals. So who is Rebecca Keeves? She's an experienced civil barrister with over 11 years call. She's a polymath of qualifications in psychology, law, and law and business. She somehow manages to squeeze around the outside of this a quite active part in the arts, including dancing, acting, and singing. To me, I refer to her as girlfriend. Welcome to the podcast, Rebecca. Thank you for having me. That's okay. So what I thought is we'd start kind of at the beginning before you come into contact with me and do some more digging around dyslexia. So what is your sort of first uh, recollection of people with dyslexia or kind of a school memory of it? Well, we had people at school who would be taken out of the normal class for a variety of reasons. It wasn't ever really properly discussed as I think it should have been because, especially now, I think it's as important for people who are neurotypical to understand dyslexia as it is for people with dyslexia to understand it. We, uh, at my upper school, just called them the the room four (laughs) uh, because that's the room that they were taken to uh, in order to assist them. I remember feeling at the time, because I knew uh, certainly at least one person who was in the room four group, and I thought, I'm not really sure this is helping them because they're being taught the same things in the same way, just at a slower pace. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're never going to achieve their potential uh, because it seemed to me that, and obviously I wasn't in the room, but it seemed to me that they weren't having the adaptations that they required um, but of course, you know, I'm I'm 34. This was this was quite a while ago. Um, I was also a teenager then. That was that weird decade called the 90s. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> the 1900s. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I may be doing them a, a disservice, but but that's how it seemed to me. Yes, I remember being. It wasn't room four in my school, but we used to go, and I've got very vivid memories of this particular room. One thing I always wanted to ask, really, was. Um, get the 25% extra time and yes. I'd sit an example where the whole cohort got up and left. Do you ever wonder why some people sat behind in the example? Um, I understood why they were getting extra time, not not necessarily the specifics of it, but I knew, we obviously, we knew who the room for kids were mm-hmm. and we therefore knew that they got extra time. And also in some of the lessons it would be uh, referred to also and so you'll have extra time because there wasn't much uh, keeping it out of the way it was just said at the end of class oh you'll get extra time (laughs) Um, (laughs) very sensitively I mean I I have to say it was less of a thing in my classes um, because I was in the subjects where we were setted um, I was in the top sets Yes. So there were oh, the top six. <laughs> <laughs> I was one of those. Um, um, but there were some subjects we weren't setted for. So, for example, our year nine sat. So our year nine English class wasn't setted. I will never. I don't understand why. But they they didn't really properly set us until after our sats. So I was more aware of it then. But I never. I don't know why. I never questioned why people were getting extra time. I don't know how I knew why they were getting extra time, but I just feel like I did. (laughs) So you were saying about the settings, and I remember for some bizarre reason not being setted in English until the GCSE years of school where I was in the bottom set rather than Mm -hmm. the top set. So obviously you wouldn't have much, I guess you wouldn't have much interaction with dyslexic people at that point. But did you find you'd have certain kids that would seem to be absolute whiz at science and maths and then they disappear for your English set? Oh gosh, it's thinking back. I mean, the school I went to was, was really big um, when, we, when we're talking about GCSE and A-level style um, things. I'm just trying to think. I've, I think I've largely blocked those years out. Appreciate <laughs> <laughs> um, to the choir. Yeah. Um, I can't say that anyone jumps to mind as having been in the, the science sets and then, and then not being in the English sets. But then, uh, you know, I was mostly concentrating on not blowing something up in science so <laughs> i may have missed it not blowing stuff up <laughs> not blowing things up that i'm not supposed to blow up <laughs> but that's the fun bit what are you going on about well no because i was a swat <laughs> i a didn't what? want to get in trouble a swat 
Uh, yeah, really? Oh, okay. Like um, a nerd. Uh, oh, uh, okay. yeah. I got the teacher's pet award at school <laughs> and stuff God, like that. Yeah. No, I, I don't what think we'd have been together. <laughs> um, I don't know what SWAT stands for. I don't know. It was always just called a SWAT. <laughs> I thought that was a general term. I enjoy no, no. this because we because we don't. Yeah, but it's swatting up for like yeah. exams, but I hadn't heard of. Yeah, I guess it comes. From it that, comes from that. that. Yeah, I, I found this really interesting because obviously I don't come from where we live now, yeah. and I will say things sometimes, and people will just be like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> yes, yes. And it appears that I can add SWAT to my list. Yes. Yeah. We used. To, uh, I've heard it referred to as people who don't do much work. SWAT some weekends and Tuesdays. <laughs> <laughs> that was not me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, and obviously there is the military unit. So <laughs> okay. So apart from knowing the kids that may have to sit behind or are taken as you called into room four, I guess being quite a high achiever in school and. And it, the system really suits you, that you wouldn't have a sense for people that it doesn't necessarily suit or you just know they've got to go off this other room and it sort of sits sort of slower to them. Yeah. And then, as you, you sort of mentioned about maybe feeling that was not necessarily what you thought was a good idea if they're working slower to the same work, doing yeah. the same things. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I didn't, I didn't really know much about it and about the learning differences then, but... I don't know, something, I do remember something just not sitting right with how it was being done. So did you, obviously you going through university and studying a law degree, no, you studied psychology first. I did a history and psychology degree first, it was combined. I left history off. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, yes, and then went on to do a graduate diploma in law. Okay, were you aware of any of your classmates at that particular point as a young adult, maybe being having extra time in exams, sort of, the guys from the school system who may have gone off into room four and now appearing in your university life or was it kind of not something you were too aware of? No, not really. I mean, I don't, in my law studies, I don't remember anyone at all, I have to say. And maybe that is something to do with the amount of reading and just memory recall, parrot fashion style (laughs) things that we have to do. Um, My undergraduate degree was a bit odd because it was a combined course between history and psychology, but I think it was the first year they'd done it. Mm. So I did all my history subjects with the history bunch and all my psychology subjects with the psychology bunch. And there were only actually five of us that were doing the history and psychology course. So I know none of the the five of us had any particular issues, (laughs) but I didn't have too much to do with the wider group because they obviously made friendship groups with the people they were in every lecture with. Of course, of course, yes, yes. Uh, I had a similar thing in my uni where I was the, the mechanical and electrical engineering student and there was a small cohort of us and we all plugged into the electrical guys and the mechanical guys whenever we did, but it was our, our little group. Yeah, it sounds like you kind of didn't have too much touchy with it until I, I guess, really meeting me. Well, I, I would come across it at work because a lot of what we do requires, in civil law specifically, requires written work. So you, not necessarily from the actual lawyer point of view, but from the client. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very aware of vulnerable people and um, people with uh, any, anything that would fall, you know, in the discrimination bubble, as I would call it, and being aware and making sure that we're not sending things to people in writing who might struggle with that, whether it be a learning difference or a sight problem or things like that. So... We would always do in whichever employed status I was in at any time, you would have to do equality and diversity training and think about how you would help identify if someone had an issue that would affect the way you communicated with them. Um, So it was in my mind, and I have to say, I thought I understood dyslexia (laughs) until I met you. (laughs) That's what I would say. I, I was aware of it. Um, I suspect certain um, members of my family have it and always have done. Uh, not always had it, always suspected it. <laughs> yes, and, and felt like I knew I knew about it. Um, but what become clear to me over the last year or so is that I, I didn't know about it. Yeah, that's interesting. So there's one thing I want to come back to is the equality and diversity training. So yeah. how does stuff like a learning difference like dyslexia come into that uh having because I've, I've touched on that before and it, it tends to lean towards more should we say stuff that the eyes can pick up initially and they started bringing neurodiversity in really quite recently how would you find that before with because obviously you're in the world of language and 
lots of written words. Mm. And I wonder whether there is more into it compared to me, who's in more of a visual kind of field anyway. Yeah, we, I, I would say that we're, we're very aware of it. Obviously, I'm talking very generically. And I'm sure people yeah, have sure. their own anecdotes about situations they've been in. But most of my work's done in the courtroom. As a, as a practicing barrister, that is the majority of what I do. Um, and so actually, relatively recently, bearing in mind I've been an advocate for 11 years, but relatively recently, I've had two situations that involve a person with dyslexia. Mm -hmm. One was they were my client, and one was that they were someone I was cross-examining. Okay, so let's start with your client first. How did that come up? How did they tell you in the first place? Because quite a lot of people, depending on the generation, really struggle with disclosing and it's a big question at the moment with neurodiversity of do you tell people do you not you know obviously I wear it on my sleeve now where quite a lot of people still feel embarrassed about it depending particularly a bit depending on their age range yeah absolutely and this was an older gentleman yeah. um, who was my client uh, it it tends to come up quite early on in the initial conference that we have with them. When I say initial conference, I mean the meeting we have with them half an hour before we go into trial. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's not very initial. <laughs> no. That's 11th hour, isn't and it? Initial for me, that's my first point of contact with them so. nine times out of ten. Yeah. So the I meet them at court, and the way civil proceedings work um, is that you don't tell the court your story. Right. You have to do it in a written witness statement. And ah, then, uh, yes, yeah, see <laughs> you see the problem. problem. <laughs> um, and there's all sorts of ways and rules about how to deal with people who don't speak English, for example. Yes. And we have to, when they go into the witness box and they affirm, which is the I do solemnly, sincerely, or you know, whatever religious affirmation that they choose, mm -hmm. confirm that their statement is true. I will always get them to reread their statement at court so that when I'm confirming it with them in the witness box, I can say, have you had the opportunity to read this today? And they can say yes. So when we're in the conference, I say to them, you're going to have to confirm your witness statement. Here's a copy of it. Um, can you just read through it? Because I'm going to ask you if you've read it and I need you to be able to say that you have. If there are any problems with it, let me know. And at that point they go, I can't really read. Um, this gentleman in particular was severely dyslexic and he said, I can't, I can't really read. And that, that raises a number of uh, issues that need to be overcome. The first is, how do we deal with it there and then? Well, that's quite straightforward. He had his wife with him, so she read it to him. If he'd have been by himself, I'd have read it to him. How do we deal with it in court? We just let the judge know. So okay. I just say to the judge, my client has dyslexia. I have, or his wife has, read his statement to him. So then when I'm admitting it, I change my words. And instead of had you had the opportunity to read this statement, I say, have you had your statement read to you? Mm -hmm. And then confirm it is true. Um, and then when we're referring them to documents in the often large bundle of documents that we have that are all pa paginated and have the, have the page numbers on them, yeah. instead we will often, with people who are neurotypical, turn them to a page and say, if you can just have a, a read of paragraph three. Okay. If we know the person we're talking to is dyslexic or has some other reason that they're going to struggle with that, we say, turn to this page so they still have it out to them. Paragraph three says, and we read it out. Okay. So to them, I hope it doesn't feel like it was any different, that there's anything specific being done, but we know we're putting in what we'd call kind of special measures. Okay. So, because you're a civil barrister, so you don't really... Uh, just for people to visualise out there, that you're not sat in front of a judge with a jury. You're no. sat normally two barristers, your client, your opponent's client. So do you just disclose it in front of effectively the whole court? Yes. So we tell, I would tell my opponent first if it's my client. Before you get in. Before we get in. Um, I would obviously ask my client's permission to do that mm. um, and point out that it is in their benefit, mm. uh, in their favour to do so. So I would let my opponent know um, if they're an experienced barrister, we all know how to deal with that situation. If I think that they are a newer barrister, then mm -hmm. then I will assist them with the best way of doing that. And do you think it'd be any different in uh, crime cases where there's jury? Do you have to disclose it to the jury? Well, crime's very different because it's less document-based. Right. Okay. 
Okay. So in crime, you do tell your story. You get into your witness box and your barrister takes you through in examination, what we call examination in chief, your version of events. Okay, so a few good men. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's more military, but but, it's, yeah. <laughs> but a similar thing. You know everybody's doing that. Yeah, or absolutely. the John Christian movie, and yeah. I can't remember its name now. A Time to Kill. Yeah, Time to Kill, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so they'll say, you know, where were you on this day? What were you doing? Whereas for civil brashes, that's all in a witness statement. Ah, okay. Because I, I was thinking as you were sort of relaying that, that quite a lot of people feel uncomfortable about it. And it's, it's fine when it's a judge, two barristers, and maybe the, the opposition. So having to do that to a whole jury of 12 strangers could be a big thing. But yeah, absolutely. it's a different layout, and that's one thing. So, okay, so that's what you do in that situation. And a bit of a, a, a warm up to the next episode of this podcast. We actually have a dyslexic barrister on, so we can hear it from the barrister's point of view in terms of studying law and being able to deal with that as a barrister. So tune in for that one. Um, But you mentioned you've been in cases where the opposition has a client that is dyslexic. Yeah, I mean, it's it's happened a few times, but really recently, actually, I had a trial and uh, the other side came up to me and said, oh my God, my client has you know, quite severe dyslexia. And I said, oh, that's fine. I can, I can deal with that. That's fine. And, um, and he, he kind of went on about it a bit in the conference, which seemed unnecessary to me. And then he made a, a really big deal of it in front of the judge. And I just thought, that's just not necessary. Uh, exactly what you were saying about it, it can be quite uncomfortable for people, rightly or wrongly. People, yeah, yeah. people are uncomfortable with it. And, um, and there's just no need to do that. We, we mention it so that the judge doesn't, for example, draw an, an inference from the fact they're taking longer to read something or longer to answer a question um, based on a written document. So it's important the judge is aware of it, um, but it isn't, it isn't necessary to make a song and dance about it. No, no, I, I I totally agree. It's I think it's important, as you say, for the inferences. And yeah, if the judge goes, "Can you read this statement out?" and they're like, "Panic," <laughs> <laughs> it could look different in a courtroom. Exactly. And yeah, the judge is obviously trying to make his best judgment on the information they have put available to them. And if the person's acting a bit strange or standing for, up in front of a classroom and reading something out loud is was my worst nightmare as a kid. So let alone stood in front of a courtroom trying to prove one way or the other in a in a case with loads of very learned individuals in front of you must be really intimidating. Well absolutely. And it's a it was a road traffic accident. Okay. So it was just my client's word against his. So oh, things right. like credibility, really important. Yes, I agree. Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> that's not that's not fun, is it? No, well, no, um, it's not. And um, and in particular in that case, because one of the things that we were essentially alleging is that he uh, was very easily frustrated. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh. and he did he did lose his temper at me, um, which helped me, and I did <laughs> <laughs> and I did win that case, but. I do wonder if he was already feeling a bit on edge mm-hmm. um, because because of the way it had been conducted to that point. Yeah, it could could be. I mean, that's yeah, without diagnosing that. But yeah, if you're already feeling uncomfortable because you're struggling with the whole situation, overwhelmed, and I know when I'm under hard hard stress situations, it will bring up the worst points worse. It sort of exaggerates it, but I think that's humans anywhere else, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. If you have a temper problem and you're under stress, you have a bigger temper problem. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's, uh, that's interesting, hearing how it comes from both sides and dealing with it that way. So one of the things we're kind of going to talk about is you got trained by Tessa as part of my Davis Dyslexia Correction Programme. I so did. I know some of this because obviously I was there. Yes. But you also had a Zoom call initially with her where she went through a few things with you. So I'm curious to know how you found the training, first of all. It really interesting, really helpful, really, I say, anti-Rebecca, not anti-Rebecca, but the way that I need to approach things with you when we're doing Davis method things is very not how I would naturally approach things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So so actually it's it's been a it was a challenge to learn. I mean you you are very self sufficient with it. Okay. Um so don't don't thank goodness require me to be <laughs> very good at it. Um <laughs> but I know that, that the Davis method do a lot 
with children and you know, obviously their parents, et cetera, need to do the support yes, element yes, of it. Yeah. Um, but it's, yeah, it's about, I found it really interesting because in some ways it was very, I say anti Rebecca's normal way of doing things, but in some way it was, it, it was in tune with skills that I've had to develop for work. Okay. Um, because we can't tell people what to say in court. That would be wrong. Yes. They need yeah. to give their own evidence. But I need to have an idea of what that evidence is going to be. <laughs> I see. So we develop a way of asking questions without leading people um, and making sure we get the right information. Yeah. It's not my strongest point at work, if I put it that way. But I can see a similarity between that and the way I've been trained to assist with the Davis method. Okay. Because okay. it's about getting to the the idea and the concepts that you require rather than what I would do if I was in your situation. Yes, yeah. It's getting the best model for me. Yes. But that needs to be a function of my own brain coming up with the idea. Exactly. Okay, because did she go through any of the visual tasks with you? We te I tested Richard on this last week where they could visualise the cake and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, she, she didn't. Um, I, I'm trying to remember. It's, it's quite difficult to mm. separate... I think this is a problem with doing things over Zoom, slight tangent, but yeah. um, from a memory point of view, it's harder to differentiate the meetings that I have on Zoom from one another with the same people <laughs> than in person. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I remember that I was sitting in my house when I had that meeting with her, but actually until you've just said it, I'd forgotten I'd had one before I had the one with you. <laughs> so I... <laughs> So I'm just trying to recall exactly what was said and when, but it was more a get to know you um, discussion. So she, I think it was probably more about her finding out about me. Yes. And yeah. um, she didn't say it, say this, but potentially assessing me and my suitability <laughs> and how I'm going to approach it. She is very sneaky she at trying to work out. Things, but even over Zoom, like, <laughs> yes. it's, it's an impressive uh, talent she has for that. Kind yeah, of and thing. she's lovely and yes, she yeah. completely put me at ease. Yeah. Um, and I suspect there was an element of that to it as well yeah it mainly needs the modeling side of it uh helps because yes as you mentioned i'm quite self-sufficient mm. and we're currently still on covid19 restrictions in the uk so quite a lot of time of working from home we'll do it in my lunch break and obviously mm. you're working too but yeah it's about getting models in my head and actually having a helper gets better models we do stuff with the reading tasks that i just can't do on my own as you know, the book quite clearly tells you not to do it yourself. Yes. So as, as much as I'm tempted. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you got all that training and then we sat down and we had a training with Tess, didn't we, where we built a model together. I remember that clearly. I can't remember exactly what the model was, but I remember we had to build, and I deliberately picked a kind of trickier, grammary kind of model yeah. to do because... When I've got the facilitator on hand, I'm going to do all the awkward stuff so it's easy when I'm on my own. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and there was a workbook as well. There was a workbook for you and a workbook for me. Yes, yes. Yeah, I remember you feeling quite like you sat there on the edge of your feet, like, uh, I, I want to tell, but I can't because he needs to find it out. <laughs> yeah, because there was, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I agree with you. I can't quite remember the which word it was we were doing either. But yeah, I remember thinking oh, I feel like I know what would be a good model for that. Yes. But it had to not be what would work as a model for me. It had to be what would work for a model for you. And it's very difficult when you start, because you do the play element of it. So you have the word, you learn the definition, and then, um, as Tessa would say, you have a play. <laughs> so you, <laughs> you get the play and you start things because, you know, you can always start again yes. and it's better to start something and it's the equivalent of staring at a blank piece of paper isn't it when you're trying to write something yes. and you hear writers say it about writer's block and things so you start kind of playing with it and I think oh yeah but if you put that bit there or if you put this bit here I think that'd be clearer but I can't say that um so that can be quite difficult yeah so it sounds like you've had quite a journey with how to be a good coach side of it yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, yeah, coaching, I would say, is not one of my strengths in 
in general. Um, you want my sister for that. She's an amazing coach. <laughs> or my niece, who is who is six and very much learning that skill from my sister. But um, Future leader, future leader. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but it's, yeah, I'm more of a sort of self-sufficient doer than a mm. coacher and teacher. Yeah, one of the good things... Um, I think between the two of us to this program is Rebecca's superpower tends to be her grasp of the English language. It's one of her strong skills. So actually there's been points, remember when we did, we talked about this in the last podcast, me and Richard were talking about fewer versus less. Yes. You called that one and that was really interesting. <laughs> I know, but I, I am always very aware that, that I can be a bit pedantic. <laughs> um, so this is a model that you'd done in a lunchtime when I wasn't here. Uh, but you left it out, and you usually do, and then I can see them when I when I get to your house. Yeah, we, we have a bit of a system. I'll pitch a message to the uh, model, and if Rebecca's not here to kind of give me some guidance or kind of, mm, have we thought of this? <laughs> what do you think this means? It's one of my favourites. <laughs> what do you picture when you think of this? Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it became... But the, the first thing that came to mind with, because I think you were modelling less, mm. but you'd done like a pile of lots of little bits yes. and then a pile with fewer, <laughs> as it were. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I had. <laughs> uh, um, and the reason that I was hesitant to address it is because the way language is used adapts mm, mm. as time goes on. People use words differently the the dictionary inputs new words and uh, various varieties that that people start using in everyday language and it's quite common for people to use less when they mean fewer mm, mm. <laughs> so it's like well <laughs> one how... of your favorites <laughs> <laughs> i was like well how much of this is I'm not supposed to use the word wrong how much of this is actually indicative of fewer over less and how much of it is just the evolution of the word less and the way people use it because i'm not there to correct your grammar (laughs) (laughs) no no No. i'm there to make sure you have an image for the word as you would normally use it however it's actually an image of the first kind of definition that comes up in the dictionary of it yes so i use oxford and then cross reference it with cambridge online so actually going into the nuances of how it's used in common language versus the dictionary can be tricky <laughs> it can and especially with the way language evolves yeah and you know the dictionary is almost forced to add in words that are being created by common use yes um so ipod iPhones in there, I think. Yes, but even I things like that that are, uh, are nouns, really, um, and, and, and are moving along with technology are slightly different. I, I'm thinking my one of my pet peeves, and it's uh, my understanding is it's been formally adopted now is irregardless. Irregardless. Irregardless doesn't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> irregardless is the same as regardless. Yes. Okay. And people have essentially mush together different words that mean the same thing. They think of irrespective and regardless, and they come up with irregardless. <laughs> and it's been adopted as, I think, a non-common word. Right. <laughs> well, which is ironic because the whole reason it's there at all is because it's now a common word. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it is important to have to move along with these things, um, something I struggle with. <laughs> <laughs> but in respect of your, your modelling, like yeah, you say, it's yeah. taken from the dictionary definition, um, but those things are then open to interpretation. Mm, and that's what caught me out with the particular example we were talking about mm. where I'd read it but interpreted it and it was only when you come along and sort of gave a bit of a nudge like, uh, what was it you actually said? I think you come in and say, like, oh, you've done less today. Um, and something along the line, can you explain the difference between that and fewer? Yes. And I couldn't. Couldn't, yes. <laughs> and then me being clever, went to read the dictionary to go, ah, ah, uh, ah, uh, no. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I said something like, can you can you explain how this model would be different from a model for fewer? Something yes. like that. Yeah. Um, which, you know, if Tessa's listening to this, she may say it was the wrong way of coaching. <laughs> but I couldn't think of how else to do it. So, yeah, it, it's it's a balancing exercise. It isn't, language isn't a science, it's an art. Yes, yes, it is indeed. So 
we've sort of discussed the program, but what I thought would be quite interesting now is your sort of views and opinions on dyslexia, I guess, have changed since we've started dating each other, really. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know I how you say it so hesitantly. <laughs> yeah, since, I, I, since we started I, I, dating. <laughs> <laughs> since we started, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, somehow you managed to go on a date with me, even though I probably used the wrong your in the text messages. <laughs> Do you know what? And hopefully this won't end our relationship. But I, <laughs> I remember saying to my aunt, I must really like him because it, his grammar's not very good. <laughs> and the things that would normally have really irritated me just didn't with you at yeah. all. Uh, and actually what I... I can find new ones. <laughs> what I realised, because when we first started um, spending more time together and I would see you on your phone, mm. when you're texting, there's a, a very concentrated look on your face. Mm. Okay. And... <laughs> To start with, I was like, oh, does he need glasses? Should I be saying something about <laughs> needing glasses? And then as I understood that you were dyslexic and more about that, I was like, oh. And then what I thought was, well, we did a lot of messaging in the early part because COVID relationship and yeah, all of that. Yeah. Online dating. Yeah, yeah, socially distanced dating. Yeah. And to me, I went, oh, actually, he put in a lot of effort it warmed the cockles <laughs> but it was, it, was really, it was really nice to think actually you know so much of online dating is often oh throw away texts or people are messaging you know five different people or whatever and it just rang very true with me that you had put in a lot of effort in those early stages and I think that's a very different way of looking at, at the situation than, say, maybe like twenty-two-year-old Rebecca would have looked at it and she'd be like, "Well, he, well, if he can't, if he can't get the right there, <laughs> then where is this going?" <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to, well, actually, there's a lot of effort going in there, and that's indicative of how he feels about this relationship and where it might go. Mm, okay, so <laughs> now you're going to tell me you weren't really bothered about me. <laughs> 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 series a great yeah. proofreader <laughs> no. <laughs> no and I thought it was really interesting when we were having conversations about it because we met in the June and I didn't go on the program till the end of January so quite a few months we'd sort of spoken about it a lot I mean the website didn't get launched till December mm. and I wasn't even working on it when I met you so there's kind of a nice path i guess uh particularly it would like if you use me as a micro case study on this from what you saw beforehand mm. which is the sort of professional engineer me done the university work and was kind of done quite a lot of work on it but still thought there was this kind of definite stop i was going to hit to shifting doing the program and then sort of the, you've got the post analysis so to speak or not still working on it the mid-game analysis at the fourth quarter kind of thing how did you find that shifting through like what was your i mean we've talked about your initial gut mm. feeling how did then that change is what i sort of would talk you through things and we'd just have discussions about it because i remember you coming home from court and mentioning the cases that you'd had yeah and you're like oh i had a, a good explanation for this because now i understand and you were saying you, you didn't really understand much about what it was until we sort of restarted getting close. No, I mean, I I always thought that I understood it, that it was a problem with reading, that people would confuse their B's and their D's <laughs> and their P's and their Q's. Yep, yep. And and that I understood that letters moved around mm -hmm. and I, you know, I knew about blue paper might help. And <laughs> I knew that there were certain fonts. I didn't realise there was dyslexic fonts, mm -hmm. but I knew that certain fonts were better than others. And I probably considered myself a lot more knowledgeable than I than I should have done about it and a lot more um considered myself a lot more aware than I than I am um now the the reality is that those things aren't dyslexia they are a symptom of the way our education system teaches people with dyslexia mm. dyslexia itself is a, a different way of learning that is an incredible skill um, that society would benefit from if it would only adapt to it. And that's the change that, that I've experienced through um, our, 
our situation and going through the Davis program mm, and reading mm. The Gift of Dyslexia. Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, society has sort of already benefited because, you know, theory of relativity and all absolutely, that. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but how many more people mm. might have been in that position to make such substantial contributions to society if they hadn't just been told they were sick their whole childhood? Yes, and um, um, yeah, rather than being... You're meeting them in your professional sense when mm. they're, they've done something wrong. Yes, mm. yeah, they, that is depressing sometimes when you look at some of the stats when but they have changed education around. Yeah, and and you know you look at the stats of the people in prison. Yes, yes. I yeah. mean, I don't know if this gentleman had dyslexia or not, but when I used to practice in criminal law, and I did a case for a gentleman who who was constantly in the magistrates' court for petty crimes. I mean, the case I was um, representing him on was that there were actually three charges and he was, he'd was he stolen some ham from Tesco's. Everyone knew who he was in the court. It wasn't a court I went to. As soon as I said who I was representing, they were like, oh, John's here. <laughs> right. His name wasn't John, obviously, but <laughs> John's here. I mean, frequent, frequent fly Frequent fly yeah, 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 they yeah. said something about that. And they, <laughs> I mean, they joked that, because I was representing him on his 99th conviction, um, wow. Yeah, and he was due back in April. And they, they were like, oh, we're going to get him a toy cricket back for his century. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, <laughs> and when, and he was in his late 40s, maybe early 50s, and you have to fill in a form when you're in the magistrate's court about your means. Mm-hmm. And he couldn't do it. He said, oh, if you can fill it in, I can just about write my name. Now, whether that comes from a learning dif- a difference or whether it's just a flaw in in the system mm. um you know a lot of people in that situation have been in and out of care things like that which is even worse for people with dyslexia because then it won't get picked up because they just get moved around so much yes yes you you tend to find the people have got that one intervention with somebody's kind of a light bulb's gone off in somebody else's head is like have you ever been tested for this yeah yeah, I mean, how many dyslexia stories go, well, there was this one teacher or mm, there was this one yeah. person, social worker, whoever it is, who had come across it somewhere else and was like, oh, I think you might yeah. have dyslexia. Yeah, I've got the one teacher story and I've heard ones where it's people who go back into education is because they want to do something fun in their 40s and they decide mm. that having a degree would be a good idea and they're like, they get popped for the test and like, what? Mm. <laughs> but I, I don't understand and they got the good end of their professional career behind them and yeah. they got picked up on this last thing and they're whoa or their kids get statemented and they realize they do the same thing as their children mm. and they're like oh, hang mm. on hang on what's going on here so maybe if we just and i say just i appreciate mm. the costs and the effort involved yeah but i just think if the education system can adapt to a identify it and b address it mm. in the way well, potentially the way that the Davis method does, but if not something you know equally as productive, mm-hmm. um, then it would have such a knock-on effect. And I could I could rant for ages about why I think that that's not going to happen or why things don't change in the way they should. <sighs> um, yeah, because you do a lot of um, advocating for social mobility within the bar as well, which is uh, coming from things at a different angle. Yeah, it's mainly focused because I'm from a working class background yeah. and um, people from working class backgrounds don't tend to think that they can be barristers. Mm. So that's largely how we work on it. But we are looking to have a link with a neurodiversity group as well. And I say that there is so much overlap and crossover yeah, yeah. between things. Yeah, I think so. I think well, when you have, you've explained to me about the social mobility stuff, and I do think it's it's a lot to do with people's perceptions and so yes yeah, so it's gonna be fun in next podcast talking to sam about being dyslexic and a barrister because it kind of blows my mind that she succeeded very well in a profession that um is the world of words and so we're going to do a deep dive into how she's managed that but we're, that's more for the next episode <laughs> yeah absolutely and of course i know sam through the social mobility committee yes yes uh, she, she, or not to steal her thunder, but she predominantly practiced in a different practice area to me. So mm-hmm. b- while paths wouldn't normally cross, mm. um, but that's how we know each other. Okay. So I wanted to, I think I've got a few almost going to be standard rapid fire questions at the end here. But okay. I, one thing I want to hear is um, a bit more about how you found from a third part point of view, 
the difference in me between before going on the Davis program and afterwards. Okay. I'm going to get emotional. <laughs> that's all right. We have the power of editing up. <laughs> I'll make sure the volume is turned up really loud. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, okay. Um, I, I remember, uh, I'm sure you do as well, getting, getting quite kind of emotional, mm-hmm. watching you be able to do things that not only you didn't do before, but had resigned yourself to the fact you wouldn't be able to do. And seeing you use words in a way that you hadn't done before, it's completely different getting messages from you now. I, I proofread um, some of what you write, and mm. that's a, a very different experience. <laughs> it takes half the time now. <laughs> 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 it does take less time but it's also i think the before there were there was more um need to discuss with you what you'd said and what your intentions were behind it and i appreciate this there's there'll be an element of me getting to know you better as well but of course but there were some things that i just wasn't sure what you meant at all and now it's more like a usual proofread, if I say that, of a, of a more like proofreading something for a neurotypical person, because we all reread what we think we wrote, and you know everyone should get everything proofread. Yes, and it's definitely. more akin to that now um, than I wouldn't look at what you write now and say, "Oh, I think this person has dyslexia," mm. which is more of an advert on its own, like more of an example of how being taught as we're mentioned in the last episode with being tra- taught as a PC but you're actually a Mac now understanding how to use Mac OS mm. if you didn't know me and I'd sent it to you as a professional proofreader you'd just think it was a standard thing and you wouldn't be able to pick this up out of the crowd if that makes sense yeah, which exactly. is really interesting <laughs> um, no that's that's uh, that is really good to hear and I had wondered what your sort of from the outside looking in because to me it feels easier to carry on and to do stuff and emails at work and all that kind of stuff. It's interesting to hear somebody I have to I communicate with quite often and interact with has noticed the step change in it. And yeah, but it's not just the practical thing either. There's a confidence in you that there wasn't oh, well, before. Okay. I think you, and you may well correct me, but <laughs> I think you have had a shift in how you feel about dyslexia mm-hmm. and see it far more as a benefit right yes than anything else um and obviously you've gone on to do you know the amazing website and this podcast and things like that and it is it's really impressive and it's also really great how you're putting it out there letting people know what having dyslexia actually means and not seeing it as a negative no Oh, well, thank you. I mean, that's good. It's it's coming across that. Uh, um, yeah, <laughs> I think it does. Has shifted my thinking. I mean, well, you know, <laughs> something you thought you kind of, I guess you kind of hit the limit of maybe, and then it sort of all gets pulled away, and the curtain gets kicked back, and it. Oh, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I think that's the right word. I think that that you would often use the the, the word limited or limits. Yes, and that's not there anymore. Yes, 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 yeah. The, the shift from being, and I hate when people say they've been diagnosed with it. Yes. But I sort of had to stick to statemented. Yeah, the shift in thinking when you realise, hang on, I just need to learn how to program it correctly does shift shift gears on it really and uh, away we go. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's really important because I, um, well, this is part of what, going back to what we just, what Tessa, Tessa and I discussed in our first Zoom, mm-hmm. because I was concerned um, about it, because yes. it was called the <laughs> Davis Dyslexia Correctional Program. Mm. <laughs> and <laughs> yes, I can see you. That made me uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and it sort of took took me to a place of, of um, you know, the correctional programs for people who are homosexual and things like that. It, I associated oh, it with that. Yeah, and, <laughs> Alan Turing and all that kind of yeah, stuff. And, yeah. I, and I was very much thinking, well, no, this isn't, that isn't helpful if this is a dyslexia can be sort of beaten out of you type program. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't. Yeah. I wasn't helpful. But no. what became apparent to me, and I appreciate that the Davis program has been around since the eighties, so it may simply be a language usage point. Mm. Um, is that it's it's correctional in the sense it corrects the way you've been taught. Yes, it's not correcting you as a person. No, no. And it was one of my initial talks when we were having the prelim of the program with Tessa was that I understand it's a gift. I want to keep the power of it. Mm. I don't want to fundamentally change me, but I want to mitigate the downsides of it. Yeah, it's alleviating the symptoms, not getting rid of the difference. Yes, yes. And it really concerned me, actually, initially. Yeah. But, but yeah, as discovered time goes on. And it does get me thinking, well... Yeah, how many other things do we hold that kind of belief about? Yeah. Not just dyslexia, but other things that actually if you could liberate people on their self-limiting beliefs or teach them in a way that suits them, mm. how it sort of opens the world up to other things. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I think what I'm going to do is I've got a couple of rapid-fire questions here to sort of round out with. So pretty much because I listen to many podcasts and enjoy this bit. <laughs> okay, so I've got to be quick. That's no, no, no. <laughs> rapid-fire questions, not rapid-fire answers necessarily. Oh, okay. What prejudice do you think you you held about dyslexic people that you've now been proven wrong as you experienced with myself and the program? I don't think I was necessarily prejudiced. Because I do think I was quite open-minded about it, mm -hmm. albeit that I didn't have a full understanding of it. I think I was open-minded about it in the sense of understanding that it wasn't necessarily a reflection of intelligence mm -hmm. and that there are tools that could be adopted. Um, I think I now understand that there is a benefit to it rather than it just not being a disadvantage. Yes, okay. I think that's the biggest change for me. I think there is prejudice around it, but I think I was quite open-minded about it. I will be interested to hear what Sam has to say on the next podcast because <laughs> yeah. I, I do a lot of written work and I do wonder how, how... I don't know any civil barristers with dyslexia. Um, so from a point of view of how it works in a specific career... Mm -hmm. so, that is so wordy and yes. so written words um, is is going to be quite interesting, I think, because it is important. It, you know, one word wrong can change everything. Um, my first what we call multi-track trial case, I was on day one faced with an application to strike out my client's claim because the person who drafted... Uh, so written the initial document that yeah. the case is based on, put um, avoided instead of avoidable. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and I had a lenient enough judge, but that's how specific we have to be. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm interested to see over the next, well, over my career, mm. how this develops with um, with dyslexia and other learning differences within yeah. this profession. Yes, because you get contacted now a few times by students don't you who i do yeah are neurodiverse now which... yes because largely because i share a lot of neurodiversity things on linkedin yes um, yeah. and i i have a strong student base anyway and i do a lot of work with universities and things like that um and i do have people contact me and i uh, and the the most frequent question is do i leave it off my application Yes, brings us back to what we were talking about earlier yeah what is normally your advice in that situation if because I imagine people who've got that question will be listening. Yes, I. It, it's difficult because the way applications at the bar work is that you are usually applying for a pupillage, which is like an apprenticeship, mm. and um, barristers are part of a set of chambers usually. Uh, everyone's self-employed but band together for expenses and things like that and teamwork and, and champagne all that. and caviar and, and <laughs> <laughs> no that isn't helpful <laughs> um, no but to McDonald's, to, sorry. Yeah, but, yeah, McDonald's, a bacon sandwich yes that's um, it. so you you never know we don't have hr departments mm -hmm. you never know who that application is going to go before so i only ever talk for me, if I'm reading that application and what I think my chambers would do about okay. it, and I say put it on. Yes. Um, it's important. Mm -hmm. Also, if you are putting in an application where you've got a 2-1 or above law degree, you've got your 
bar qualification course um, and you've done it whilst having dyslexia. <laughs> You've got a hard worker there. That you've got a hard worker. Yes, who, definitely. Who is who is of the same? Who has proven themselves in the education system to be of the same standard as the other people who are applying? Yes. It's more difficult when you get a situation where, for example, they've got a two-two and they're trying to use it as mitigation, because the problem with that is, but that isn't something that's going to go away. So you got a two-two, and you say that's because you have dyslexia. Yeah. Yeah. But that's going to follow on. Um, but I had someone who was who has been statemented since her qualifications, very very recently. Okay. In between yeah. finishing the bar and applying for these apprentice apprenticeships. Ah. Um, and I said, well, definitely put it on. Yeah. Because yeah. you you got the same qualification as all of your contemporaries, but you had an obstacle you didn't even know about. Yes. And you did it anyway, without any help or support. And now you know about it and can get help and support that you require. So the sky's the limit, isn't it? And to word it like that, rather than, you know, put the right spin on it in your application. Oh, definitely, definitely. It's one of my favourite answers. What is your favourite, your strength and weakness? It's always the same one in an interview. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And as barristers, one of the most important things we have to do is be able to look at a case from both sides. Yes. And um, we have to think about the physical reconstruction of things. I mentioned earlier road traffic accident cases, mm-hmm. uh, you know, taking it at its extreme, picturing the murder scene, you know, <laughs> looking at you know, CSI style, <laughs> um, looking at photographs of a building dispute. Mm-hmm. And being able, and they're not always very good, and they're often in black and white, and they've often been scanned and photocopied so many times, yeah. you can't really see on there anyway. <laughs> and my understanding of dyslexia is that it it's going to help in that situation to be able to move that image around in front of you, um, look at it, consider it from different perspectives. So I think that the benefits of dyslexia outweigh the negative symptoms which of course we know can be overcome now anyway yes exactly yes okay <laughs> yeah i think i think you're totally right on that one and it's there's something to bear in mind that if you're managing to get to where you are in life with a system that's not necessarily best suited to you then using that as a way of explaining to people the proof that you have the grit and the hard work to, to get to this point is really quite an asset to employ well i believe anyway Absolutely. And the thing with any application is the way you approach what you're saying. Yes. So don't do it apologetically. No. I have dyslexia. This is why that's going to be good for you. Exactly. The power of it or the gift of it. The gift of it, one might say. (laughs) Yes. Okay. I'm going to finish with one more question, which is how would you describe dyslexia now? A dyslexic person has a different way of being able to view the world that enables them to solve problems where neurotypical people can't find the answers. And there is a significant strength to this that the world and society can greatly benefit from. There may be some elements that they will struggle with, um, but these can and should be overcome with the support of those around them. Brilliant description. So, thank you very much for coming on and talking about this today. Thank you for having me. And all show notes will be posted on dyslexialifehacks.com forward slash podcast. And I want to thank everybody for listening.